Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about compressed sensing and dynamic mode decomposition, which is a recent paper uh, written by myself, Josh Proctor, Jonathan Tu, and Nathan Kutz in the Journal of Computational Dynamics. So a little bit about what dynamic mode decomposition is first. So DMD, or dynamic mode decomposition, is a data processing method originally developed in the fluid dynamics community which takes large data sets, uh, typically of velocity fields or vorticity fields in time of a fluid simulation or a fluid experiment. And what the dynamic mode decomposition does is it provides a spatial temporal decomposition of this data into modes or dynamic modes that are spatially coherent and oscillate and or decay or grow uh, at a fixed frequency in time. Okay, so the DMD method is essentially a data-driven method. This works equally well with uh, data from experiments or simulations or historical records as long as our data is uh, time resolved. So we have snapshots of data in time. This is either velocity fields or vorticity fields. We take these snapshots and we reshape them into tall vectors. So my vector is x0 at time t0 x1 at time t1 all the way up to x at time t m minus 1. So I create this data matrix of snapshots, and then I create a shifted, a time shifted matrix x prime, which has all of these snapshots of data at one time in the future. Okay, so now instead of x0 to x m minus 1, I have x1 to x m. Now in the process where we take these snapshots and turn them into uh, vectors x, we can easily get millions or billions of degrees of freedom or a million or billion tall vector in many high dimensional fluids applications as essentially this would, with this, would, uh, this would correspond to the number of degrees of freedom of my system. Okay, so in this image on the right, uh, courtesy of Love Vision, their, their particle image velocimetry system, can generate tremendous amounts of uh, velocity field data, which we would then stack into this matrix X and the time shifted matrix X prime at the next delta T uh, in the future. And dynamic mode decomposition is built on this observation that the data at a future time X prime may be related to the data um, at a previous time step X by some large linear operator A. Now this is not saying that our dynamics, our fluid dynamics are linear because we know that Navier-Stokes are, are inherently nonlinear in, in many situations, but we're going to relate the data in X to the data at a future time step in X prime by this large linear operator A. And this operator A has enough degrees of freedom to approximate the evolution of the system even though it's, it's nonlinear. So dynamic mode decomposition is interested in finding the leading eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this big A matrix, the best fit linear operator that tells me how data in X maps to data at a future time step in X prime. Okay? Now if these were reasonably sized matrices, we could do this using the pseudo inverse. We could get A equals X uh, at a future X prime times X dagger, where X dagger is the pseudo inverse of x, right, we just pseudo inverse x and solve for a. But if this is really a fluid system or some high dimensional system, maybe it's a climate or a, a neuroscience system where I have millions of degrees of freedom in x, then this A matrix would be million by million and it would be too large to even represent, let alone do an eigen decomposition to find dominant eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So dynamic mode decomposition essentially amounts to an algorithm to find these leading eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the best fit linear operator A, uh, given that we don't actually ever want to compute this object A. So the process is as follows. The first thing I do is I compute a singular value decomposition of my data matrix X. This is a big SVD. And what I get out are uh, these matrices U, sigma, and V complex conjugate transpose where the matrix U has columns which are my proper orthogonal decomposition modes, my POD modes. Okay, so for those of you who are used to doing dimensionality reduction in fluid systems, you'll be familiar with the SVD of X giving me POD modes in this matrix U. And these are ordered in terms of importance uh, from the most energy containing columns uh, first, 
all the way to the least energy containing or kind of the, the modes that I can neglect to the right columns of U. Okay, so now instead of ever computing A, this large pseudo, uh, this large least squares best fit operator A, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute A projected onto my POD modes uh, in U. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take my A matrix, I'm never actually computing it, but if, it, if, the, I, if I had this A matrix, I could left multiply it by U complex conjugate transpose and right multiply it by U. And what I would get is this expression here, this small expression for A tilde, which essentially tells me uh, what is the low dimensional structure in this big matrix A. Okay, so if I keep, uh, let's say that the dimension of my state is N, maybe a million. So A is N by N, million by million. Let's say that my low dimensional structures, my POD modes, I only need 10 or 20 then this A tilde object would only be a 10 by 10 or 20 by 20 matrix, okay? So that's the real magic here, is that we take big data, X, we take its SVD, we project onto a kind of low dimensional operator A tilde, which tells me how POD modes are evolving. So now I'm looking at how uh, the POD coefficients of each of these time snapshots is evolving from X to X prime. And it's easy to do an eigen decomposition of this little A tilde operator, this 10 by 10 or 20 by 20 uh, operator. So I take an eigen decomposition of this little A tilde operator, and then the real uh, kind of heart of dynamic mode decomposition is in this reconstruction in step four, where I can get the full high dimensional eigenvectors of my big A matrix by essentially taking linear combinations of columns of X prime obtained uh, from this eigen decomposition a little a tilde. Okay, so the, the general procedure, I collect my data, I organize it into snapshots that are staggered in time, I take a big SVD of X, then what I do is I take this, this very large A operator and I project it onto the POD modes of X, I take an eigen decomposition of this reduced order operator A tilde, which tells me how POD modes are evolving in time, and then I can use that little eigen decomposition to reconstruct large high dimensional eigenvectors of this A matrix, which we're calling phi in step four. Okay, so our eigenvalues are given by lambda. They're just the eigenvalues of this little eigen decomposition of A tilde. Those are DMD eigenvalues. And they tell me if my mode in phi is oscillating, that would be a complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues, or maybe this mode is growing exponentially or decaying exponentially. And with these modes and eigenvalues, we can essentially get a linear model which describes how this, this nonlinear system evolves um, using these phi's and lambdas. And there's some deep connections to nonlinear dynamical systems through the Koopman operator theory. Uh, and there's a number of references below that essentially establish and elaborate on this connection. So to see the dynamic mode decomposition in action, let's consider data from uh, a simulation of vortex shedding past a circular cylinder at Reynolds number 100. So the first step, re remember, is to collect data. So we collect snapshots of the system in time. I basically just take this movie and I take the first image, the second image, third, and so on and so forth. And I take and organize those into large data matrices. So in this case, I'm plotting vorticity, and I basically take one frame of the movie and I stack all of those uh, points of vorticity into a tall vector x naught, the second frame x1, x2, and so on and so forth. So I build these two matrices, x and x prime. And now what I'm trying to do is I apply this dynamic mode decomposition procedure, so I get approximate eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this big A operator using dynamic mode decomposition, which is essentially a regression, a linear regression of the dynamics. And what I get out in stage three is the dynamic mode decomposition. I get modes and I get the time component of how those modes change in time. Do they grow or decay or oscillate or are they constant? And so with those DMD modes and eigenvalues, I can get a future state prediction. I could possibly use this for control. So lots of interesting things we'd like to use dynamic mode decomposition for. But as you can tell from just this brief overview of the theory, there's a lot of data acquisition required, right? I have to collect this large amount of data to fill X and X prime. 
I'm doing linear algebra on this big uh, matrix X and X prime. And so this might be uh, expensive to collect all of the data and to process all of the data. So what I'm going to tell you here, and this, this paper about compressed sensing dynamic mode decomposition, is how we can leverage sparsity and compressed sensing ideas to speed up uh, the data acquisition and the processing of dynamic mode decomposition. So the goal is to reconstruct our, our full DMD modes, but from heavily subsampled measurements. So in many applications, such as particle image velocimetry and fluids, I am limited, uh, the amount of data I can collect is limited by the, the spatial resolution of the data I want to collect and how temporally resolved I want my data to be. In some cases, I can't, just, I can't even transfer data fast enough from the camera to the memory uh, for the, the spatial and temporal resolutions I'd like. So what we'd like to do instead is heavily downsample these images uh, in space so that we need, less, we need less data acquisition and maybe we can speed up or increase the bandwidth of our PIB. So there's lots of other work uh, related to sparsity and dynamic mode decomposition. So uh, Jovanovich et al. looked at how to select only a few modes that are most important from the DMD. Uh, Jonathan Tu et al. looked at sparse sampling in time. So if I don't have nice time-resolved data, could I infer what the time-resolved DMD would be using compressed sensing ideas? Uh, there's our paper, which um, is really talking about sparse sampling in space, so only taking a, a limited subset of these pixels and seeing if we can infer the full dynamic mode decomposition. Uh, and then there is also uh, sparse sampling ideas in, um, in reference four below. So these are all great um, uses of sparsity to enhance dynamic mode decomposition. So just a brief overview of what we're going to be leveraging here, this theory of compressed sensing. The basic idea here is that there are many high dimensional signals in the real world. So for example, that big X vector of my fluid velocity field, for example, or an image that you take, you know, a, a big uh, megapixel image. These might be very, very high dimensional signals or vectors, but it turns out that if you write these vectors in an appropriate transformed basis, they turn out to be very, very sparse. So this is the entire idea behind image compression, where if I take that uh, megapixel image, I can Fourier transform the image, and in the Fourier domain, most of the Fourier coefficients of that image are small and can be zeroed out and neglected. So this is the basis of compression of images, audio, movies, lots of signals are sparse on a transform basis. And so as long as you can uh, map them into this basis where they're sparse, you can massively compress uh, the amount of data you need to keep track of. So compressed sensing is a new idea within the last 10 years, which says instead of collecting all of this big data and then compressing, and in some sense, the proper orthogonal decomposition and the dynamic mode decomposition is a compressed representation of our full, full fluid field. So instead of, of collecting all of this data and then compressing, what compressed sensing says is in some circumstances, it's possible to collect many fewer initial measurements and infer what those sparse Fourier coefficients or sparse transform basis coefficients had to be to be consistent with those measurements. So here's a picture uh, pulled from Baruniak's 2007 paper. This is a great illustration where what we have is this psi matrix here is my, my basis where my signal is sparse. So in this case, A is a vector of Fourier coefficients. Here, psi is like an inverse Fourier transform. So if I multiplied psi times A, I would get a vector x. Um, x would just be my megapixel image or my fluid velocity field. A is the sparse vector of Fourier coefficients, okay? If I measure a s many fewer measurements y, right? So this is many fewer measurements than the dimension of, of x, then in some circumstances, I can infer what the sparsest vector of coefficients had to be to be consistent with these measurements. And then I could uh, go back and solve for what x had to be, my full image or my full velocity field. So there's, there's no magic here. I mean, we could have done this for a long time, except that before compressed sensing, this would have been a combinatorial brute force search 
to find the sparsest vector of Fourier coefficients that were consistent with my, my, my small measurement, my 1 or 2% uh, measurement. And so what's really special about compressed sensing is that there are theoretical guarantees on when we can apply convex optimization routines like L1 minimization, where we, with high probability, find the sparsest vector A without a combinatorial brute force search. And what's really special about this, this means that if I have bigger data, then I can essentially allow Moore's law to catch up, and in a few years, my computer will be fast enough to handle bigger and bigger data, which is not true of the brute force search that we would have had to do before compressed sensing. So the takeaway message here is that signals, almost all signals, fluid velocity fields, audio signals, images, they're sparse in an appropriate transform basis, in this case, a Fourier basis. If my signal is sparse in a Fourier basis, then I can get away with taking many fewer measurements as long as my measurements are smart in some way or you know, not really well aligned or, or uh, in the same direction as this, the columns of the sparsifying basis. So as long as I have enough good measurements of my system, I can infer with high probability what the sparsest vector of coefficients had to be. So what this means is that if I have a fluid velocity field, I can, instead of measuring all million or billion uh, you know, velocities at every spatial point, what I can do is I can measure 1% of those velocities random, at random points, and then I can infer what the sparse vector of Fourier coefficients of that velocity field had to be, and then fill in all of the gaps for the other 99% of the velocity field. Very cool. Uh, theory of compressed sensing, and we're going to use it to make the, the dynamic mode decomposition possible even if I had massively undersampled data. So the idea of this sparse or compressed dynamic mode decomposition is pretty simple. Okay, so I'm just reiterating the math I showed before of what the DMD is. We have DMD modes and eigenvalues. It's built on this singular value decomposition of a data matrix X, and it's depicted um, schematically on the right here as I take data x and x prime, I do some math, and I get eigenvalues lambda and modes phi. So what we're going to do, um, okay, and here's just some examples of what the DMD looks like on this cylinder data, okay? Turns out it looks a lot like the POD, um, but the, that, that really doesn't matter for this. So what we're going to do with compressed sensing DMD is the following. We're going to assume that instead of having access to X and X prime, this big data that's full resolution, we're only going to take random, uh, random pixel measurements of this, this fluid velocity field. So in the cylinder case, we're basically going to act like we only have 1 or 2% of all of these spatial measurements randomly. We're going to do a DMD on this compressed data, y and y prime, so the exact same math. I get lambda y and phi y. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this compressed sensing L1 minimization step, and I'm going to take my compressed DMD modes phi y on this 1% data, and I'm going to reconstruct what my full high dimensional, um, in this case, 100,000 dimensional DMD modes would be. And so for this case, with 1,000 measurements and roughly 100,000 dimensional um, full state, we see that we actually do a pretty good job of reconstructing at least the leading DMD modes. Now, higher, uh, higher frequency DMD modes are a little bit noisier, um, so it's not perfect, but we're getting away with only measuring about 1% of the data here, um, and we're getting a pretty good, a pretty good approximation. It turns out the eigenvalues are almost perfect. They're nearly within machine precision, which is great. So the DMD eigenvalues, lambda x, almost exactly equal lambda y, and the modes are pretty close using compressed sensing. So if we were limited by hardware, if we, really, um, if we could increase bandwidth by decreasing spatial resolution, we might be willing to do this expensive L1 minimization step because we could get access to faster flow fields uh, than we previously could with existing hardware. But this L1 minimization is pretty expensive. So we have an alternative approach, which we just call compressed DMD. And the idea here is if we had access to our full data, let's say we actually did have all of these high dimensional measurements X and X prime, instead of just computing DMD directly on X and X prime, which involves a really expensive SVD, 
we're going to first compress this data down to a very low dimensional uh, compressed subspace y and y prime. We're going to still do DMD on y and y prime, but now instead of doing L1 minimization or this expensive compressed sensing step to go back to our full dimensional DMD modes uh, phi x, it turns out if you actually have access to the full dimensional data, you can just apply this simple formula. You take linear combination of columns of x prime and you get a very, very good approximation to our DMD modes in the full dimensional space. Kind of surprising. Um, and here is a comparison with just two modes. And notice this is that high frequency mode that was hard to get earlier. If I take as few as 21 measurements, p equals 21, I perfectly reconstruct my first mode. And if I go up to 40 measurements, this is just 40 pixels that I'm measuring in the wake of my cylinder, I can get away with, uh, with really reconstructing all of these DMD modes. So just a reiteration. If I had access to my full data, but I didn't want to do this very expensive singular value decomposition, I could just randomly pull 40 or 50 or 100 of those data points spatially, do DMD on a much, much smaller data matrix Y, and then I could reconstruct and infer what my high dimensional DMD modes were uh, by taking linear combinations of my full data X prime using these transformations on my compressed data. It's really beautiful, very, very fast. You get a huge speed up. Uh, so you can essentially take cluster size operations of dynamic mode decomposition and do them on your laptop now because you can, you can get away with this compressed sensing, uh, th this compressed EMD step. And schematically, I just want to, you know, there's been a little confusion. It's, it's a little confusing because we could do uh, compressed sensing where we really didn't have access to the full state data, or we could just do this compressed EMD where we do have full state data and we're just trying to speed it up. So I want to just walk through this data flow. We have some source of data. If we are in the regime where we only have access to spatially subsampled data, maybe we're trying to boost our bandwidth or we have unreliable sparse sensors in the ocean or something like that. If I, if I only have access to sparse sampling of my data, then this I don't have full state data. I have to do DMD on compressed data and I have to reconstruct modes by this compressed sensing L1 minimization. We call this compressive sampling DMD or compressed sensing DMD. If I did have access to my full data, so I had all of the data spatially resolved, temporally resolved, I might still want to make that computation faster. So then I would do this compressed DMD. I would take my full data, I would compress it, I would do DMD on the compressed data, and then I could reconstruct modes just using linear algebra. And so this, uh, this step on the right, compressed DMD, is much faster uh, than compressive sampling DMD if we had access to full state data. But even if we didn't, even if we only had access to subsample data, we could still infer what the full state DMD modes are, which is pretty cool. All right, so if you had buoys in the ocean, if you had enough of them, you could probably infer the dynamic mode decomposition of what it would look like if you had a really high resolution sensor net. And we can also do an error analysis of these two different methods. So here on the top, we have the compressed sensing DMD where essentially we only have access to like 1% of, of the data. Here this is a double gyre flow where we have two basins that are kind of oscillating back and forth and swirling. And if I look at the L2 norm of the, uh, the true DMD mode phi versus the reconstructed DMD mode phi, we see that our error does go down as we have more and more measurements. So around 1,000 measurements or about 1%, we're getting pretty low mode errors. And compressed DMD, so this is when I have full state information and I'm just doing compression, DMD, and then reconstruction. Uh, the L2 norm drops off much, much more rapidly. This is on a log scale. And with as few as 100 measurements, I actually have very, very good agreement between the true DMD modes and my compressed DMD modes. So two different options. If I only have access to limited sparse data, I can do compressed sensing DMD. It's expensive though to compute and the error drops off somewhat slowly. If I have access to full high resolution data, I can compress it, do compressed DMD, and I actually get away um, with very accurate results and very, very fast computations. Okay.
So one of the last things I want to show you is just I want to give you an idea of why this works. So there's some beautiful theory um, about essentially why compressed DMD works. Uh, and the idea is there's a, a few pieces. So the first fact that's really important is dynamic mode decomposition is invariant to right unitary transformations. What do I mean by this? If I take my data x and x prime, and I shuffle all of the columns of x, and I do the exact same shuffling of all of the columns of x prime, I get exactly the same dynamic mode decomposition. I get the same eigenvalues lambda and the same modes phi. It's a very cool property, so you should try this, right? Do your, your dynamic mode decomposition, but do it by first swapping all of the columns of x, and the same swapping of all of the columns of x prime, you'll get exactly the same DMD. So it's essentially, this is because SVD, the singular value decomposition, is invariant uh, to write unitary transformations. So that's one fact. The second fact is that dynamic mode decomposition is mostly invariant to left unitary transformations. So if my, my compression matrix C was actually a unitary matrix, so for example, if I swap all the rows of X and X prime, or if I do some other unitary transformation on the left, when I get out my dynamic modes from my, my transform data Y, they're exactly equal to my dynamic modes X, but pass through that left unitary transformation. So this is what I mean by it's almost invariant to unitary transformations. I get the same modes, except their rows are also swapped in the same order. Okay, so the result is that the dynamic mode of, dynam of, of, um, of x and x prime is related to the dynamic mode decomposition of any unitary transformation of my data. So what are some, some unitary transformations? Well, the discrete Fourier transform is a very useful unitary transformation. The POD modes from a singular value decomposition, also a unitary transform. So right off the bat, we have a few different transforms of our, our data where we should get um, exactly the same DMD modes. Okay, so if I, if I do DMD on my data, or I do D, DMD on the FFT, the spatial FFT of my data, it, the DMD modes I get out are the same, they're related by a spatial FFT. Now, these are just facts of dynamic mode decomposition and singular value decomposition and linear algebra. So if but remember, our, our compression C is not a unitary matrix. A unitary transformation is like an n by n matrix. In our case, we're doing heavy, heavy compression, so C is not unitary. This is where the theory of compressed sensing comes in. Remember, our data, our data was assumed to be sparse in some transform basis, because basically all data is. So if my data, and that's written on the right here, as y equals C times psi times S, so what we're saying is that our data x is sparse in some transform basis psi, then compressed sensing essentially gives you conditions when my measurement matrix C, my compression matrix, times that sparsifying basis psi act like a unitary matrix or an isometry on sparse vectors S. So essentially what's happening here is we're able to do this massive compression uh, of, of the DMD data in X because that data is sparse, and so our measurement matrix C times the sparsifying transformation psi act like an isometry or a unitary operator on that sparse data, um, that sparse data. So DMD is invariant to left unitary transformations, and if I had a sparse data matrix S, then DMD would be invariant to uh, these near isometry transformations given by compressed sensing. So that's just kind of a high level overview of why compressed DMD works. It essentially relies on the sparsity of my data in a transform basis and the fact that if I have enough incoherent measurements in C, then uh, the product of C times psi gives me something that acts like a unitary transformation on sparse vectors. Okay. So the last uh, parting thought here is that we have provided all of our code online, so you can follow this link. Uh, downloads csdmd.zip. We essentially have this nice example of a sparse dynamical system that evolves on a torus. So here we have these uh, five spatial Fourier coefficients that are driven by a sparse dynamical system. They give rise to this nice uh, kind of these spatial temporal coherent modes in this plot here.
And this is really easy to generate and analyze this data. So you can download uh, the MATLAB codes that generate this, and then you can try out the different compressed or compressed sensing dynamic mode decompositions. You can try different compression ratios, different kinds of, of pixel sampling, anything you want. Um, the, the MATLAB code is here. OK, so that's an overview of our recent paper on compressed sensing and dynamic mode decomposition. I hope you enjoy. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to, uh, to email us or contact us. Thank you.